It's a story of courage, sacrifice, and survival, etched into the dusty annals of American history. The Battle of Little Bighorn, fought on June 25, 1876, along the banks of the Little Bighorn River in Montana Territory, a clash of cultures and arms that would forever change the fate of the Wild West. Among the chaos and carnage, a small band of soldiers fought for their lives, their honor, and their country. Sergeant Stanislaus Roy was there, and this is his eyewitness account of the bloodiest battle of the Great Sioux War, told with unflinching honesty and raw emotion. Join us on a journey into the heart of combat, where the sounds of gunfire and screams still echo through the Montana plains, and the spirit of the American warrior endures forever. So, sit back, relax, and let's embark on this fascinating journey together. As you watch this video, remember to click the like button and subscribe to our channel to support this community. On the 5th of June, we got caught in a snowstorm between Hart River and O'Fallon Creek, and the weather was mighty cold. Roy says the wagon train only made it as far as Powder River and didn't head to Rosebud before turning back. We saw Indian graves in a hollow between Miles City and Rosebud. That's where Reno rejoined us after his scout, near Foot Keo. Between there and Rosebud, we came across a low-lying area with Indian graves in the trees. The men of G Troop tore them down, took what they wanted, and threw the bones into the Yellowstone. Some of the boys warned Macintosh that G Troop might regret doing that. As we rode along the Rosebud, we saw that Indian ponies had eaten the grass clean off both sides of the trail for a long stretch. Roy says that on the 22nd, we left camp at noon and headed east into the timber, about a mile from the mouth of Rosebud. We cut across the hill, struck the river, and crossed it, keeping to the west side. It seems like Custer followed the same route that's now marked by the road. Roy says he always heard that Bob Jackson and Billy Cross never crossed at Fort A. Nobody remembers seeing them in the valley fight or on the west side of the river at all. There's about 50 yards of timber on the west bank of Ford A. Reno's advance was made up of companies G, A, and M in that order. After we crossed the ford, we formed a line, and while we were getting into position, I heard some of the boys say, there goes Custer. We could see him over on the hills to our right, across the river. We dismounted about 200 yards ahead of the timber, and the skirmish line advanced to the point of the timber. Company G was on the right, a next, and M on the left. Roy's sure there wasn't any timber to the right of the line. Some Indians were in the timber ahead of the right of the skirmish line, firing away at us in an oblique direction, toward the southwest. The skirmish line extended west from the point of timber, not where I marked it on the map. Roy saw Charlie Reynolds, wounded and dismounted, trying to follow the troops in retreat, musket in hand. After my horse got wounded, it went crazy, and I couldn't control it, but it carried me through all right. We were ordered back from the skirmish line and went into the timber, about 50 yards in, to get our horses. I saw Wallace, mounted and leading G Troop out. I asked someone where my horse was, and Wallace said, grab any horse you can get and get out of here. We all went out the south side of the timber. Roy thinks he was on the skirmish line for about 20 minutes, fired off about 20 rounds, and saw ravines over toward the hill full of Indians shooting obliquely to the line. He also saw Indians across the river, opposite the timber, circling around toward the east, through the timber. When I went in, I saw Gilbert coming out of the timber with four horses, one of which was mine. I mounted up and followed the column, yelling to Gilbert to follow us and get. I was behind Gilbert and got out of the timber pretty late. About 75 or 100 yards from the timber, I saw Charlie Reynolds, wounded and dismounted, standing still and putting up a fight. Soon after, my horse got shot through the jaws, just back of the mouth. The horse went down, then jumped up again, and I mounted up. My sling belt flew over my head when the horse fell, and I lost my carbine, so I only had my revolver left. I made it to the river safely, the water was about belly deep for the horse. I started up the bluff right away. My horse was bleeding badly, so I had to abandon him going up. I heard folks saying Reno would join up with Custer, and I told Moylan, Captain, I'm dismounted. He said, well, get yourself a horse, which I was eager to do, since it'd be dangerous to be on foot if the command had to leave. About 10 minutes after getting to the top of the bluff, Bentine showed up, and we talked about joining Custer, 
then I mentioned getting a horse to Moylan. I went back down to the river, about halfway, and got my horse. Soon after, Bentine came up, then we went out and came back, with Sioux warriors chasing after him. There was heavy firing, till dark. King got wounded on the evening of the 25th. On the evening of the 25th, we built breastworks. After the firing stopped, Reno came up to Moylan and said, I need a non-commissioned officer to volunteer to lead six men to stand picket in front of Company A's line. Moylan called on several non-com officers to volunteer, but Hain was wounded, Feller refused, and McDermott was needed as first sergeant instead of Easley, who had been on guard the night before. Then Moylan called on me, and I agreed to go if I could get volunteers to come with me. The privates who volunteered were Connor, Gilbert, Bancroft, McClurg, and Harris. One other man volunteered but backed out at the last minute. I told Reno I would take one of the men on one relief. After the men volunteered, I went to Reno for orders. He told me to have them sneak out one at a time, as the Sioux were still galloping around, and we could hear them plain as day. He said to have two men stay awake at a time, talking to each other to keep from falling asleep, as we were all mighty tired. If the Indians opened fire early next morning, we were to scatter and run for the breastworks, but not in a bunch. We carried out the picket duty just as ordered, and at dawn, when the Sioux opened fire, we retreated to the line safely and in good order. My captain complimented me on my duty that night. The fighting started at daylight on June 26th, and it was heavy till about 10 a.m. We saw hundreds of Indians riding around us like racehorses, firing so heavy that they cut down all the sagebrush in front of us. A little rain fell around noon on the 26th, and the men used their ponchos to catch some water, but not much. On the morning of June 26th, F.C. Mann, a citizen packer, was killed. He was behind a breastwork on Company A's line, aiming his carbine over the top, about three feet high. After being in that position for about 20 minutes, someone noticed something was wrong, and upon checking, they found him stone dead, hid in the temple, and killed instantly. He didn't even move from his position, still sighting his musket. Around 11 a.m. on June 26th, we dragged up more dead horses and extended our line towards Bintin's position, giving better protection to the men. In my opinion, Bintin saved the command. He was a very brave and nervy man. We were getting mighty thirsty, and some of us chewed grass to get some saliva in our mouths. Cowley went insane from thirst and didn't recover for a while, so we had to tie him up on June 26th. After Bintin's charge, the cry for water was loud, especially from the wounded. Some of the enlisted men suggested volunteering to get to the river for water. The officers agreed, and 19 men volunteered, but the officers thought that was too many and decided 12 would go. We took two canteens each and six two-gallon camp kettles. Sergeant Feller and four other sharpshooters could see the timber on the west bank and kept the Indians from gathering there. Still, many Indians skulked along the river bank, ready to fire on anyone trying to get water. As we made our way down from the top of the bluff, we had to run across an open space about 100 yards wide to reach the head of the ravine. From there to the river, we were hidden from the Sioux. We made it to the mouth of the ravine and saw Indians in the brush on the opposite bank, but we didn't want to fire and start a fight. The ravine was about 20 yards from the water. Madden, from K Troop, was the third man to rush for water and got hit, breaking his leg. But he crawled back to cover on his own despite being a big, heavy man and in a lot of pain. He asked to be left there, thinking he'd be safe. He was carried up later, before dark. The water party consisted of Roy, Gilbert, Madden, Wilbur from M Troop, Bancroft, Harris, Voigt, Peter Thompson, Golden, Tanner, and Coleman from B Troop. Roy's not sure about the last three names, though. I was the fifth man to dash for water. In the ravine, we numbered off and agreed that each man could choose to go or not as his name was called. The first man, whose name I forget, came back with a full kettle, and we all took a drink, our first in 36 hours. I think Wilbur was fourth, and he got wounded. After Madden was hit, he crawled back, and we gave him water and tended to him. Then, there was a pause of about half an hour before anyone went for water again. We spent about an hour in the ravine getting water. We'd rush to the river, fill the kettle, and then fill our canteens from the kettles. It took us about an hour and a half to get back to the top of the hill with water, 
and Lieutenant Varnum was put in charge of guarding it. Dr. Porter issued water to the wounded, but there wasn't enough to quench their thirst. The fight continued, but the Indians slowed their fire and withdrew towards evening. That night, we dug pits towards the river to secure our water route and brought up plenty of water for the men. That night, Scout Fred Gerard, Bill Jackson, Lieutenant Derudio, and Tom O'Neill joined us. I heard Derudio yell hello, and the guard, George Bott of a troop, challenged him. Derudio identified himself, and the officer of the guard allowed him to approach. We were overjoyed, as we had assumed they were killed. We had seen Indians leaving the valley on the evening of June 26, but suspected it might be a trick. On the morning of June 27, we took the horses down to water, and it was a pitiful sight to see them plunge their heads into the water up to their eyes and drink greedily. The 7th Infantry arrived and camped in the bottom, near where McIntosh was killed. The officers of Gibbon's command generously gave up their sugar, lemon, and other luxuries for our wounded. On the 28th, I was tasked with helping to shoot about 20 wounded horses that were scattered along the bluffs, which had been left behind during our retreat on June 25th. Some of these horses had been wounded during the fight on Reno Hill and had wandered off. On the morning of June 28, we went to the Custer battlefield to bury the dead. We carried our wounded to a camp in a village opposite the battlefield. Some rode horses, while about 30 had to be carried by hand on blankets, with the infantry assisting us. We formed a skirmish line and buried the dead. Following what we believed to be Custer's trail, we came across the first dead body, that of Corporal John Foley of C Company. I recognized him easily, with his bald head and black hair. He was middle-aged and well-known to me. Foley's body was at least three-quarters of a mile ahead of the main group of dead at sea. The next body we found was that of Sergeant Butler, lying about halfway between Foley and the main group at sea. There were no dead horses near either Foley or Butler. I helped bury the bodies on the west slope of the ridge and finished up with the E Troop men near the gully. The stench was overwhelming, and I went to the river to get a drink and alleviate my nausea. I hope this first-hand account gives you a new perspective on the Battle of Little Bighorn and the Great Sioux War of 1876. Stay tuned for more videos like this. I hope to bring you more first-hand accounts of different battles, so have a great day and I'll see you next time.